Hello viewers and uh, welcome to this episode of Reminiscences. We are in uh, London, in the home of my old teacher, Professor Patrick Wilmot. He is a Jamaican who spent uh, more than 18 years teaching sociology at Ahmadibella University in the 70s before he was suddenly sent out of the country during the time of the government of General Ibrahim Babangida. Since then he has been in London uh, as a commentator on African affairs and as a writer uh, of many books and indeed as a member of the Transparency International, which monitors corruption in Africa. So Dr. Wilmot, welcome to the program. Uh, let's take you back to your early years, Jamaica, 1942. Were you, did you grow up in Jamaica, really? Yes, I mean, I went to primary school, secondary school. Then I went to university in America. That's, that's why I asked the question. Uh, how much of schooling did you do in, 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 in Jamaica? Just primary and primary, secondary school? Primary and secondary school. Yes. Yeah. Then, Can you um, tell us a little bit about your family background, your, your parentage? No, my family was very, very poor. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I lived in places where there was no electricity, no running water, so... It was difficult to, like, I mean, to do homework, but I mean, I, I started reading when I was quite young and I went to the library all the time and I used to read these uh, popular books like Tarzan and The Lone Ranger, The Hardy Boys, and, but I read very fast, so I finished reading these books after a short time, so then I started reading books by by Hegel, by Freud. I read biology books. I read um, Marx. This was still in secondary school? Before oh, I went, still? Yeah. W even before I went to secondary school, mm. I was reading um, mm. all kinds of books. Mm. So um, then I took an exam um, when I was staying with my grandmother in the country. In Jamaica? In Jamaica. And I, it wasn't a very good school, so I, I didn't pass the exam. Mm -hmm. The following year, they said I should take the exam again. But I said, no, if I take it again, I'll fail. So what I did, I took the more advanced exam. And I came second in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, I got a scholarship from the secondary school, a Jesuit uh, boys' school. And then after I got the one from the, the Jesuits, the government insisted that I should take a government scholarship. So um, I, I went in, I skipped the first two forms, I went into the third form. The first year I came, the first term I was there, I came second in the school. And then from the rest of the time I came first. So then I, I got a scholarship to Yale University, full scholarship. Then from Yale, I went to Vanderbilt University. Yeah, this, this scholarship, so, so you, you got the opportunity to leave Jamaica and go to the U.S. Yeah. On, on government, who, which scholarship was this? The Yale University. Yale, yeah. Yale University has so much money that mm. they could afford to give me a full scholarship, mm. including, I mean, accommodation, clothing, mm. my airfares, um, everything. How old were you then when you, when you went to Yale? 19 mm. years. I was 19 years old because the, at the time, secondary school finished in December mm. and Yale began in October. So during that time, I went to teach in a boys' school mm. for, for, for a year. So I went there when I was 19 years old. Which year was this? 1962. How was the experience from Jamaica, as you say, from a rural, poor background to this great citadel of learning in the U.S.? I had no problem at all. I mean, I, 
I mean, I never forgot about where I came from, but I was in school with boys whose parents were millionaire, billionaires. Mm. And um, George Bush was two years behind me. I was in the same class with John Kerry. We used to play football together. John Kerry is the former U.S. Secretary of State. Yeah. No. So I, I met I met these guys. I would go to their houses in um, the Upper East Side in New York, which is where people like Rockefeller lives. And then somebody would meet me wearing a, uh, one of these tailcoats and stuff. So I, I would think he's the father of the my classmate. Mm -hmm. It turned out it was the butler. <laughs> oh. And I looked on the wall and there were original pictures of Picasso and Modigliani and all these famous people. And there's this guy just dressed just like me in a sports jacket and and uh, dungarees or something. And, but I never had any problem at all. I never felt out of place. Uh, what happened after you graduated from Yale University? I got a full scholarship to Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University, which was a university in the south of the country in Nashville, Tennessee. And I mean, I, I did very well there. And then I got this uh, scholarship, a Kent, a Kent fellowship, where they paid all my tuition, my accommodation. And um, at the time, I was given $250 a month in 1966. This is at Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt University. You are doing your master's? Uh, yeah. Master's and PhD. Mm. But this fellowship was not... Van I, I got a full scholarship to Vanderbilt from right. the university. Right. But while I was there, there was this fellowship. If you are 10% in the graduate school, yeah. then um, there are about 3,000 people who applied and um, I think about 15 people got this the fellowship. But it was, I mean, the best fellowship in the US at the time. So I got that and I spent some time in Nashville. Then I went out to California, then I went to Paris. And I mean, all this was financed by the university. So you seem to have had a comfortable time in the US. I mean, on scholarship up to PhD level. Yes. Did you did you experience any problems, discrimination and things like that that are unpleasant? Not at all. As a Jamaican here. I mean, any anybody who knows me know that you, you don't you don't mess with me. I mean, if you if you do something to me, I will do something 10 times worse to you. So I never had any problems with uh, white white people I mean they um if they were polite which was most of them were it was okay but if they tried to be nasty I mean they knew that um you know I had a very nasty mouth and uh, I also wrote for the school newspaper and um I was I was strongly against the Vietnam War and I wrote against that. And um, if anybody tried to attack me in the newspaper, I'd go after them. So I never, I never had any problem at all. So, so after Vanderbilt, you are a brand new PhD scholar. Yeah. Did you, did you, did you stay to teach in the U.S.? No. no. I was offered jobs in the U.S., but um, when I was in Paris, I met. Um, Why did you go to Paris? I just, I just wanted to get away from the U.S. And I wanted to experience Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was there, I mean, I was involved in the student, student movement. I did some work in a, a television studio. And um, I, met, I met some people who were working for the federal government in the Nigerian Civil War. So this is in Paris. In you, Paris, you, yeah. you, you, When you went to Paris, you are not working in Paris. You are just kind of... I, I'm supposed to be studying, but... Okay. I spent a lot of time 
in uh, organizing demonstrations and you are studying after the phd yeah yeah so um then i met uh i met md yusufu and he invited me to come to teach in Nigeria. Teach in so, so this was in Paris. MD Yusuf was then the Nigerian chief of police. Yeah, he was well, head of security. Yes. So he knew these people in um in Paris that I knew. Mm. I mean, the, the daughter of Richard Wright, Julia Julia Wright, she um she was there with her husband, and they had been in Ghana with Nkrumah and they were working with the Nigerians to prevent the, the French from recognizing the Biafran regime. And of course, they knew people like Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Josephine Baker. You've, you've heard of her. She's just been put in the Parthenon. Mm. So with these people behind us, there was no way that the gold could recognize mm. the so, Biafrans. So at the point you met uh, M.D. Yusuf, in France, in Paris. No, no, I, I met him in Nigeria. He oh, he sent me a ticket to come to see him. Okay, so so you he just heard about you and invited you to yeah, come I mean, to this, Nigeria. Yeah, these, these people that I worked with, mm. they they knew him and they told him yeah the things I was doing. So he said, well, I should come to teach in Nigeria. Yeah, there is this thing about you helping the government. Then I think this was the Gaon government to do some propaganda about the civil war. Yeah, I mean, I... So I was this the connection with MD Yusuf? Yes. Mm. So it, was, it was strictly with MD. Mm. So, um, like I said, the point was to prevent France mm. from recognizing Biafra. Mm. So that was, that was successful because in France, I mean, Intellectuals have much more power than business business people. Mm. So there were business people who wanted to recognize Biafra because of the oil. Mm. But um, because of people like Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Josephine Baker, it was not possible for her. Because these are left-wing intellectuals. They, they, they were against... Um... In, in France, I mean, whether you're left or right, once you're an intellectual, you have an enormous amount of power. Mm. Because it's not like Britain, where you know the business people mm. are the ones with power. In France at the time, the, um, the, the it was the intellectuals who had the power. Mm. We linked up with them. Yeah. So when you got this invitation to come to Nigeria, at that point you probably didn't know anything about the country. Well, I knew I knew a bit about it because of. During the thing that we were doing for to prevent the Nigerians who want to prevent uh, Biafra from succeeding, with, I, I mean, I studied a lot about uh, Nigeria and uh, Africa. So I came, I came to, I mean, I had a PhD in philosophy. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a philosophy department at ABU, but. Mm -hmm. But why ABU? Why did, why did you choose to come to Zaria instead of because, other better known universities? Because MD Yusufu thought I would do a good, a better job mm. in ABU rather than Southern Universities. Mm. So he sent me to Isha Oru. Mm. Isha Oru gave me a job. And the Vice Chancellor. The Vice Chancellor, yeah. yeah. Mm. So I came, I came to, I came to teach in Nigeria. Yeah. And, uh, how did you find Nigeria settling you? You were a young man then. How did you how did you cope? I mean I, I'm I'm very, very adaptable, so I I didn't have any problems in Nigeria at all. I mean it was just like going to the US and from a poor background and mixing with the children of big shot politicians and um, billionaires. So when I went to Nigeria I had no problem, you know, with uh, other intellectuals, and uh, I had no problems getting along with very poor people in the villages around ABU. Mm. Your colleagues, uh, ABU then was becoming the center of kind of radical politics. 
I don't know, did you really have difficulty with, 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 with the radical scholars like Bala Osman and the others that were there? Not really, I mean, in fact, some, some of them saw that I was the one that was behind all the radicalism in ABM. That's what many Nigerian government, including <coughs> Babangira, mm -hmm. saw that I was the radical behind all the problems there. But how was your relationship with these young, younger radicals, I think, uh, the, uh, when you went there? There was no problem at all. I had um, a lot of, lot of young people, I mean, a lot of students. I mean, you know, the, the children of the elite in the north, most of, most of the students in Abu were, were children from, you know, aristocratic background or children of uh, civil servants or political class. So um, they, they were very receptive to what I had to tell them about um, Southern Africa, the Portuguese colonies, South Africa. I mean that that's what I focus on in my lectures. I mean, Which African, of your yeah. African um, African problems. Which of your students would you remember that have gone on to to do to do things that are impactful? Well, I mean people like you, <laughs> um, people like um, the former Emir of Kano. Um, Salusi Lamido. Lamido. Yeah. Um, A lot of, a lot of, uh, I mean, Tajuddin Abdurrahim, he, he was, he, he was at BUK, but mm -hmm. he spent a lot of time in Zara because, mm -hmm. um, you know, he came, came to see me a lot. Mm -hmm. He was, he was very, very good. Um, a lot of, a lot of people now who work in the civil service, mm -hmm. I suspect some of the politicians probably are, are my former students, um, Abdullahi, what was his name? I think he was a senator. Uh, Abdullahi. He went to, went to ABU. He was... In the Senate. I think he was in the Congress and he was in the Senate. Mm -hmm. he, he's from Sokoto. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his, uh, his, uh, his first name. People later on began to accuse you of maybe interfering in the internal affairs of the country. I mean, your commentary, your writings, they are not really limited to teaching. Uh, yeah, well, I remember um, Jibril Amin, he said that, um, he said that I was not, I was not teaching what I was paid to teach. Mm. That's not what an intellectual is. I mean, he was then the minister? Or he was a minister, yeah. Of education, yes. And, um, but I mean, uh, Jibril was an excellent surgeon, mm. but he was a 10th rate politician. He, did, he didn't understand politics. He didn't understand what the intellectual calling is. I wasn't, I wasn't in Nigeria. I wasn't a, I wasn't a, I, I wasn't a street sweeper. You pay a person to sweep the streets. You don't pay a person to think. I mean, what, what I was thinking about, about um, the African situation. I mean, Nigeria's policy on Southern Africa was wishy-washy because they were being influenced by the Americans and the British. And um, these people did not understand Africa. Everything in Africa was looked on from the viewpoint of the Cold War. Everything was America or Soviets. So, I mean, if, uh, if, if, if the ANC was being supported by the, the Soviet Union, then of course they had to support the apartheid regime even though they had to hide it because it was such a despicable regime. But I mean, I, I pointed out the social structure of Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, 
Guinea Bissau. And um, it worked. I mean, Nigeria recognized the MPLA was was the first to recognize the MPLA and um, mobilized other African countries to recognize the MPLA because the American were saying that you have to treat and the MPLA, UNITA, and the FLNA as equals. So they were supporting, they were giving arms and money to the, MP, uh, the FLNA and UNITA. And um, these people were linked to the South Africans. So I said, no, the MPLA is the only movement that represents the people of Angola. And I showed how, in terms of uh, class, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of nationalism, everything, the MPLA, whereas UNITA and uh, the FLNA recognized very, very small proportions of the Angolan people, and they were linked with South Africa, which ruled them out of the whole system. So how are you able to advance this uh, idea, especially during the Mutala regime? Because that's the period when this activist foreign policy in Africa manifested itself. Were you able, were you in touch with the, with Murtala himself, with I other people in, in the I government? I was in touch with almost everybody in the government because um, some of them I knew personally, so we talked and so on. But I mean, I used to write, as you remember from the new Nigerian, yeah. I mean, I was interviewed a lot by the, the television people. But did they, did they really ask you to, say, contribute to the policy-making, speech-writing on, on this No, things? no, I, I just did my thing and... You had nothing to do with that great speech Wutala uh, delivered of no, Africa has no, come I, of I age. Did, I didn't write that, I didn't mm. write that speech, no. So, so you are kind of uh, like a consultant to the government. You, I mean, you went on delegations and you contributed to policy-making. You are in Wutala Obasanjo. Yeah, but I mean... Not policy as if I sat down with people at, in a ministry and mm -hmm. said that this is what you have to do. I mean, I wrote in the newspapers, I spoke on television, I spoke on radio. So it's not just the government, it's mm -hmm. the people of Nigeria who are also hearing what, what I have to say. Mm -hmm. So I, I was not a policy consultant as mm -hmm. such, I was, I was never paid. Mm -hmm any money for what I was doing. And I mean, I was doing it freely on my own volition. So why were you invited to go on this delegation to Angola? Well, they said that I was the one that informed the government mm -hmm. mostly about what the situation was in Angola and uh, Mozambique, South Africa, Guinea-Bissau. Because, uh, I mean, the, like I said, the, the Americans, the Europeans, their analysis of African society was very primitive. You know, they were just saying, oh, you know, this is the, this, this country, there are these ethnic groups, blah, blah, blah. They did not understand it. They didn't understand the nature of ethnicity. For example, they didn't understand how, how the, the Zulu nation was formed from very small society and built up into a massive nation by Shaka, Shaka, Shaka Zulu. You know, so it's not, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not something that is just there like a, without any dynamism. They, you, you, they, they were just going back to these primitive people, these um, anthropologists who wrote about Nigeria consists of the Hausa, the Fulani, the, the, the Yoruba, the Igbo, blah, 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 and no idea about the nature of, of these people, where they came from, the, the, the class structure of the, the, the society. So it was not difficult to, to undermine them at all because you know, their obsession was with, with communism. 
they think that anybody who is opposing them is a communist. I mean, the, the, the Russians were supporting the ANC. That's because the Americans were supporting the apartheid regime. Were you were you a communist yourself at this point? No, I mean, I've never never been a communist. I've I've read uh, I've read Marx, but I've also read Adam Smith. I've read uh, Hegel. I've read Nietzsche. I mean, as you can see, my books <laughs> are all over the place, and I mean, uh, my bedroom is also full full of books, and I've I've read I've read all of them some some of them more than once. So, uh, so how, do you, I, how, do you, how do you describe yourself intellectually or ideologically? I'm a theoretician. Mm. I use Marxist analysis, if it's appropriate. I use nationalist analysis, if it's appropriate. And I mean, I understand the nature of, I mean, movements, like whether it's the MPLA, or Boko Haram. Boko Haram, the basic problem with Boko Haram is, is not is not Islam, it's poverty. And uh, these people are using Islam as a a way of trying to deal with the, the situation of poverty. And I mean, just as you have misinterpretations of Judaism, I mean many, many Jews think that Netanyahu, for example, is not a real Jew. I mean, you can have distortions of Christianity, like these people in Uganda who used to fight and kidnap young children and um, so on. So Boko Haram, ISIS, all these people, they, they, use, they use Islam for their own ends. But in the, in the, in the case of Boko Haram in Nigeria, the problem is Poverty. I mean, these are people who cannot afford to marry a wife. They cannot even afford to, to use prostitutes. So what do they do? They go and kidnap girls from, from the high schools and, uh, and, and use them. And then they, they find something that they say, this is Islam. Nothing to do with Islam. So, so in other words, you are not really the kind of committed intellectuals that use use your intellect to change society. You are a theoretician who, who kind of analyzes you and leave it up. If people understand the nature of society mm. and if they understand what is wrong with society, then they want to change it. I mean, the problem with Nigeria today is poverty. The way you deal with poverty is that you have an industrial strategy. You work out how to deal with the oil industry. You work out how to create factories that produce cement. You work out how to produce steel. You, you work out um, how to, to uh, make your finance industry something efficient. The problem is, I mean, you have, you have people in Nigeria who make money from distorting the whole oil industry so you know they want to keep importing refined petroleum products so they, they don't want the refineries they don't want the refineries to work they steal four hundred thousand barrels of oil a day from the pipelines you can't you can't develop your society if you have that type of thing going on so at what point did your problem with the government of Baba Ngida begin. Uh, up to the time of Murtala Mohammed government and Obasanjo government, you seem to, to thrive well. You commentator, you're also helping government to understand what's going on. Then suddenly, you were deported from the country in 1988. What, yeah. what, what led to all this? You see, the problem is uh, Baba Ngida has taken the blame, but his problem was he was obsessed with power and money. And uh, people from ABU, I mean, ADI is the only one that was exposed, but a lot of people around him were very upset that 
I was a Jamaican and I was getting all this prominence. <laughs> so they went, they went to Babangida and told him that, uh, you know, this man is a danger to your government. So you've got to get rid of him. And they assured him that he wouldn't have any repercussions, that they had control of Asu and the students at ABU and that there would be no riots if, if they threw me out. But the problem is Nigeria is just a very small country. And uh, when I was kicked out, they wanted to take me to, to Jamaica but they had to go through Britain. So they, they contacted the British in immigration. The British immigration contacted the Home Secretary and Thatcher herself and said, what do we do with this man? She said, well, you'd better do whatever he wants. If he wants to stay in this country, let him stay. Because if we do something to him, the repercussions, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world would be such that British interests would be damaged. Babangita didn't recognize that I was not just somebody that was teaching in ABU. I was, I was well known all over the world. And I mean, since I, since I, since I was in this country, I, I exposed so much that was going on in Nigeria and other African countries in Transparency. I showed how the corruption system worked with the the British banks, the British business community. So, um, in in the, in the end, I mean, I I felt. I don't feel any hatred for Babangida. I feel pity. Because he was he was misled. I mean, he, he thinks that he is an intellectual. He thinks that he's smart, but I met him and I met. Bas, the late Vatsa. Vatsa was much, much smarter than Babangida. Vatsa used to write poetry. I used to write poetry myself mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Babangida, I was there, they were eating together, I mean, because they, they knew each other very well. And it's Babang, it's uh, Vatsa who engaged me in conversation. Babangida was there, he wasn't... Was uh, it when Babangida was president or before? No, when he was at NIPS, mm. the Institute of Strategic yeah. Studies. Yeah. I used to go there to, to lecture. To teach, so, yeah. so, I so, mean, I met, I met Babangida, I met Vasa, mm -hmm. I met um, Idi Agbon, um, Abacha. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, what, what, what were you accused mm -hmm. of? Because this deportation is, is very unprecedented, a lecturer picked from his house, I wasn't taken... Picked, I wasn't picked from my house. Okay. Adi Ahaya, what were the circumstances? Adi, Adi Ahaya invited me out to... Adi Ahaya the, is a fellow, is a, is a colleague of yours in the university there. Yeah, but he was, he was working. He was working in... Um, he was working, he was working with the government at the time. I don't know exactly. I mean, I found out later that it was working with the security people. Um, well, why would he do that? He's a, he's a prominent professor himself. Yeah, but he was he was stupid. And um, he was the one who convinced uh, Babangida and uh, Guarzo <laughs> that that I was I was a danger to the country and that if they kicked me out, there would be no repercussions. Did you, did you have a chance to confront him with this uh, accusation, idea here? No. Before he, he died? No, he, he he avoided me completely. Has he has he ever he never re responded to some of the things you said in the media about him? No, mm -hmm. there was a time I was in Nigeria and um, some of these people who were the lecturers who were with me, they called him up and I spoke to him, but he he didn't he didn't he didn't say anything. You were you were cordial. You you spoke as all cordial. Yeah, uh, of course, but mm -hmm. um, I mean. When you're dealing with with people, whatever they are, you you you're, you're polite. Mm -hmm. So. I I I have no I had no problem with with uh, such people. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I knew what I was. I knew the things I did. I knew the things he did. So, no problem at all. So so you were you were abducted. 
put on a plane from Lagos and yeah. brought to the UK. Yeah. I mean, how how was you, how were you received in the UK when you when you showed up? Well, the the UK people didn't know what to do because here are these people going to the British immigration and said that look, we want this man to be sent to Jamaica. So they said, look... So you are escorted by Nigerian officials? Oh, you? the head of immigration in, in Lagos at the time. Mm. I can't remember his name, but mm. he, um, he, 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 came, he came with me and um, he tried to get the immigration people here to put me on an explain to Jamaica. And they said, look, you don't have any... You have no, no authority in this country. So they called me and asked me what, what I wanted to do. I said, look... My poor wife, she doesn't even know that I'm here. So they called They called my wife and told her that um, I, I spoke to her. That's when she, I mean, she suspected that uh, I'd been uh, out, but for a time she, she wasn't sure I was alive. Mm. So I spoke to her and um, like I said, the immigration people contacted the home office and the prime minister herself. And uh, she said, look, do whatever he wants. So how has life been in the UK since since 1988 you've been here? No problem at all. I, um, in the first year, I think I probably earned more than I earned in Nigeria in 18 years. I mean, I was writing, I was being paid for my writing. I was given a grant of 7,500 pounds, which is much more in today's money. Because they had, the, I can't remember the name of the institution that um, paid lecturers who were, you know, victims of um, this type of thing. And I mean, I was, I was, uh, I also started right. I, I wrote, I wrote a, I wrote this thing for Concord about what had happened to me, and it was on the. The front. I mean, I was on the cover. I was on the cover of Concord. And, this is the Concord uh, newspaper Con in Lagos, then. The the Concord magazine. Yeah. Magazine. Yeah. Well, I guess the the paper in Lagos also mm -hmm. carried something. I mean, in fact, <laughs> this this uh this immigration guy he he um put me in a hotel in Bayswater and. He stayed there himself. When I was at the airport, he called up um, one of my former students who was in the Nigerian embassy and he came out and picked me up and took me to Marks and Spencer to buy some clothes because, I mean, I was wearing a short sleeve safari mm -hmm. suit and it was in March, which is a bit co mm -hmm. cold here. So, um, I stayed in I stayed in that place for some time until the the thing about my stay in the, this country was formalized. So are you now a resident in Britain for a um, I I got I got a, I got British citizenship in I think less than five years. Mm. And my wife my wife who is in Nigeria now, she also got a Brit British citizenship. She has a British passport as well as a Nigerian passport. So, so what, do you, what do you do for a living now, since, since, since you left Nigeria? Uh, I, was, um, I was writing for Concord. I was writing for other magazines here. I, I did a lot of work for television, radio. I mean, the BBC, Sky, sometimes CNN. I mean, I'm retired now. I don't, I don't, I'm not working. I'm not working now. You wrote uh, two books, at least two novels that I know. Yeah, well, I'm, well, I'm here. Uh, I wrote, wrote two novels, yeah. Uh, Glass. Glass. Is it, and uh, is it double speak? Um, <laughs> what the so, hell? so I'm wondering, are these novels, are these novels bringing you some money? Do, do, do yeah, 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 I get, I get, uh, I got, I got money. I mean, um, seeing double, seeing double, yeah, seeing double. 
in yeah, the last. That that one that one I was uh, I was given an advance of ten thousand pounds. So I mean those that time it was that was probably worth twenty, twenty five thousand in this today's money. So so is it difficult to, to now that you're retired living here, is it difficult to make a living or do you still have time to do to, to, to do some work? No, right now I mean I, I spend most of my time reading, as you can see the mm -hmm. the books the books mm -hmm. are everywhere. So I, I go to the bookshop, I look around, if anything um appeals to me I, I buy it. Sometimes I, 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 I read um classical books like mm -hmm. um I just I just finished reading um um what's the name of the book? Um Um Brave New World mm -hmm. Aldous Huxley. I Clockwork Orange. But also I mean I re I read a lot of crime crime mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. Um, I read and anything that uh, I find mm. interesting. I read. How, how is your connection with Nigeria now? I know your wife. Yeah, my wife comes. She's from Nigeria, but she comes and she goes. Comes she comes and she, goes. Yeah, mm. she's in Nigeria at the moment, but she was here. She went back. She went back um, some time ago. I mean, mm. she spent she spent some months here every year. Mm. She comes and then she goes back because. She has a lot of family in Nigeria that she's mm. close to them. I mean, she wants to be close to them because, I mean, I'm here. You never know when I something might happen to me. Mm. And, um, so she keeps in contact yeah. with, with her people. Do you, do you go to Nigeria yourself now? Uh, I, w I wouldn't go to Nigeria right now because it's, it's, not, it's too dangerous with, um, with um, these kidnappers, mm. armed robbers and... You have characters in Nigeria who were probably organized to get me kidnapped or killed because they still have this fantastic idea that I had all this power, you know, which is just ridiculous. People people say maybe you were a spy. That's why that's why there's this issue between you and the government. Uh, if I was a spy, I sat on the BBC if I'm a spy, I will go back to Nigeria whenever you want. Put me on trial, and if you find me guilty, shoot me. Yeah. They never, they never took it. But you've been back to Nigeria once or twice, right? I've been, since I've the been, deportation. I've been, I've been back to Nigeria several times. Mm. Nobody challenged you or asked you, or no. maybe interrogated you or anything. Uh the when I went to Nigeria in. 2006 was it with Tajuddin and mm -hmm. so on. <laughs> I gave I gave a, a a lecture to the 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 trade unions and this this guy from the SSS was waiting for me after the lecture and he said that the director wants to see me. And so there were there were several other lecturers there, and they said, "Well, they'll come with me." And this guy said, "You can't come." And they said, "Look, we're, we're Nigerians. So just we'll come with him." And uh, we went to the SSS headquarters, and um, they said that uh, they will come with me to see the director. They said, "No, he wants just to see me." And of course. Uh, they said they should all give in their telephones. So of course, I mean, we're intelligent people. We didn't give them the telephone and they, they sent out messages that I was being taken in by the SSS people. And uh, I saw Rock got in touch with them and said, look, you know, what the hell are you doing? Because the thing was going all over the place that you're you have arrested Dr. Wilmerton. We don't want trouble. So this man was asking, the, the, the questions he was asking me was so stupid. 
And I mean, I just answered and then found, he said, look, you know, you'd, you'd better go. So I went. Do you still have friends you're in touch with in Nigeria, colleagues from the university or former students? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, there are people who I keep, keep in touch with. So, I mean, they email, email me. Like, mm -hmm. I email you sometimes. You email me. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. What, after all these years and after a lot of reflection, what do you think is the trouble with Nigeria? Trouble with Nigeria is incompetence and corruption. And um, no, no government has come with a, a, a serious industrial strategy how to industrialize the country. You can't even organize the oil industry properly. Uh, Dan Gote now has set up factories to produce cement, and um, I think he's also producing sugar. But uh, there has been all this delay with the oil, the oil refinery that he's building, which would solve a lot of Nigeria's problems. I don't know the specifics of what the problems are, but these are the things that Nigerians should have been doing from the day they became independent. They should have been building factories, building roads. They, they're they doing the railroads now, but I mean, it's still not, not properly organized. I mean, I think, I think there's a, there's a line from Kaduna to Abuja. I don't know about uh, Abuja to to Ibadan or Lagos. But I mean, the whole country should have been linked up by a network of, uh, of, of railways. And of course, you should also have buses. And I mean, when I was in Nigeria, the, the university were doing quite well. I mean, ABU was considered one of the, the best universities around. But I think uh, they have gone down since. You can't, you can't have a successful country without successful universities. So are you kind of resigned to living now in London all your life? This is, this is uh, your yeah, final I mean, home? As you, as you can see, the, mm. this is a comfortable two-bedroom flat. Mm. I have all the books I need. If I run out of books, I go to there. There are bookshops just about uh, ten minutes away. Mm. There's a massive uh, mall called Westview. They've got um, several bookstores, so occasionally I just go there. I can walk. I can take a bus. It takes me five ten minutes. I get any books, any books I need from anywhere. So. Books are your main yeah. thing now. Yeah. You, you just read books. I read books. Every day I read books, several hours. What, what else do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? I walk. Mm. I walk a lot. I walk several kilometers every day. Mm. So I have no problems at all. I don't, I don't worry about... Baba I don't worry about ADI, I don't worry about uh, Jibril Aminu. Mm. I mean, most of my friends in Nigeria, uh, unfortunately, are dead. Mm. I'm Aminu Kano, MD Yusufu, Bertala. Mm. The, only, the only people now that uh, I used to be close to were General Babangida, Je sorry, General <laughs> General uh, Danjuma mm -hmm. and uh, Professor Adam Ubeki. That mm -hmm. I understand you you just reviewed, interviewed him. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, I just heard that Professor Omar mm -hmm. has uh, has died. Yeah. So isn't living in London like yeah you know isn't it a lonely life for you? Not really. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was my birthday. Your 81st birthday. 81st birthday, yes. And my neighbor from upstairs and my neighbors from downstairs 
they took me to dinner at this beautiful Indian restaurant where I've been eating since 1988. Mm. And I had a very, very good evening. And every morning I go to pick up the newspapers. And uh, on my way to the supermarket where I get the newspaper, I meet lots and lots of people. Some, some are young, some are old. And I greet them. These they, are people they, you know, or just uh, people? I, people I just meet on on the streets, mm. and um, I greet them, chat with them, and go on my way. So I don't I don't have any problems with loneliness at all. I mean, but you live alone. I live alone. Yeah. Mm. When 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 my wife is is not here, I live alone. Mm. Mm. But um, I don't I don't have any problems. Um, I've 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 slept in hotel rooms, which suites, I mean, that mm. cost 2,000 pounds a night. Mm. I've slept on the beer ground. I've slept on raw concrete. I sleep in this two bedroom house, but I've never had any problem falling asleep mm. wherever I am. I don't worry. I don't worry about anything. I don't, I don't, I don't get dejected. I don't worry about whether this person is thinking about me or that person is not think I don't I don't really mm -hmm. I don't really care. So how how is your typical day? Typical day I get up at about half past six in the morning. I exercise for about half an hour. I do a lot of exercises because um, I have problems in my right leg because I had this mm -hmm injury in Nigeria, I think it was 1976. Mm. And um, I, I had I also had an injury in um, Angola. Mm. I was on my way to Kashito with Oba Sanjo and Adikon and, and that, that crowd. And I got this injury because <laughs> they, they didn't have any proper drivers there. The Portuguese mm. were colonized the place for about 400 years and they didn't teach people to drive mm. even the, the the waiters in the hotels were white so these Angolans were driving me driving us to Kashito and there was a Cuban tank coming down the road and um, they just jumped jumped on the bricks so I, I flew into the windshield mm damage my head and of course they had no doctors mm. because even the Cuban doctors were at the war front. Mm. So it was Adekune, the late Adekune, who took a bottle of brandy and started cleaning, cleaning the wound. And I said, look, Benji, if you're going to practice medicine illegally, at least give me some anesthetics. <laughs> I, took, I took this very expensive Portuguese brandy and drank, drank some of it because... Um, but on the way going back to Nigeria, we had a plane, so there were these... There was a basketball team that had gone to play basketball in Angola. And they were stranded, they didn't have a lift, so we gave them a lift, but they had a doctor. So he cleaned, he cleaned my wound and gave me some painkillers and um, I, I fell asleep and when I landed I think I stayed in the Federal Palace Hotel. So I, I just went there and slept and then went back to went back to Zara. So in so in London here we are going back to your daily routine, just exercise the newspaper and reading. But that's that's it for, for, for the day. Yeah, I mean I I have a have breakfast and just mm. just have some fruits, mm. some nuts, mm. orange juice. You, you eat healthy? Coffee, yeah. Mm. Coffee. Sometimes for lunch I have a salad. Or I have my, my wife normally cooks a lot. Mm. Keep the food in the freezer and then I make rice or couscous or something and have a good meal. Mm. But I eat I eat very healthy, I exercise. Mm. And um, I don't worry. I don't worry about anything. You're not worried as you get older about making a living. Whether it is, it's going to be more difficult for you as a no. pensioner. No, no. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm well, well taken care of. Mm.
Mm. Is Jamaica an option for you? Do you ever think of? No, not really, because um, Jamaica, the, the transport system is poor. Mm. So if I have if I live there, I have to have a car. Mm. I, I I don't want to mm. drive, and I I don't want uh, to be dependent on my driver. Mm. And the, the health system is not very not very good. Mm. The NHS, despite the fact that um, the conservatives here has messed up the NHS, mm. is still a superior system to mm. what we have in Jamaica. So that's another advantage about living here. Yeah. You have a medical system. The, that... NH the NHS, mm. yeah, mm. and the transport system. Mm. I mean, Shepherd's Bush here, I mean, the, the number of buses, I can get a bus to almost anywhere from here and then there are, there are one, two, three subway stations within a 10 minute walk and um, three others another 15 minutes from Hammersmith. So anywhere I want to go, I, I go and because I'm over 75, I have a bus pass mm. so I can um, take the bus or train anywhere. anywhere you don't train. have to pay? Don't have to pay. What of Nigeria? Will you will you ever imagine going back? Your wife is there. Is, is it is it a retirement place option for you? No, no. Nigeria is the same problem as Jamaica. Mm. Poor transport, poor health system, and Nigeria. In addition, the, the you have this problem with um armed robberies, kidnapping, massacres, assassinations. Yeah. So you don't you don't, don't really look forward to going back and uh, no. still spending time? No, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 81 years old. I, I've, I've done enough, I've seen enough. Mm -hmm. I have no, no intention of going to, I mean, I visit Jamaica because I have relatives there mm -hmm. and I um, many of them are quite poor, so I try to help them out. Thank you, Dr. Patrick Wilmot, for yeah. giving us this opportunity. To see you. Yeah. Yes, to, to talk to you. Yeah. And viewers, I hope uh, you followed us in this conversation with Dr. Patrick Wilmot here in his home in London. Uh, and uh, until we meet in another edition of Reminiscences, thank you and goodbye.